Ayo, what's cooking, good looking? It's Monday, July 13th. We're sweating our asses off because paying for air conditioning would make us an even poorer couple. And this is the Poor Couples Food Guy Deep Dish Podcast, where we do a deep dive on all your favorite foods. I'm your host, Eric, aka Enrique, aka Ignacio, and I got my fine as fuck co host, Meg, aka Megane, aka Mega Man. Hello. And together, we are a couple of fucking loud. Harry Dagos, oh! We hope you're especially hungry for some tasty knowledge facts, cause we're in New York, and today your main course will be penne alla vodka, oh! Okay, let's get ready with the appetizers. It is really hot, actually. That wasn't an exaggeration. We were really sweating our asses it's off. It's so hot, especially because we had to close the window and turn off the fan to record this. Yeah, if, if you've never been to Patchogue before, it's filled with assholes that like to just blast music in the parking lot for no reason. It's on a Monday night. It's it's a Monday night, not a holiday weekend, but still, people are just tailgating because why the fuck not? Because it's summer, I guess. And- I guess. Maybe, but then uh, people people started tailgating because of the fucking pandemic. Uh, I don't get that one either, because, you know, it's not like people have backyards they can hang out in. No, you got to do it in a parking lot. Which is basically our backyard, so yeah, thanks for fair. crashing our backyard. Yeah, and it's only going to get hotter now because, yeah, the window is very, uh, very much closed, and we got a lot of electronic shit in here, and we, we got LED lights. They won't heat the room up too bad, I hope. In case you haven't figured out yet, this is going to be a very Italian-American edition of Poor Couples Food Guide because penne al vodka is a very traditional Italian-American dish. Let's just say, thinking of penne al vodka brings out the true Guido in all of us. On that note, I'm going to be throwing a lot of O's in there because, believe it or not, people actually do go O in Italy. That's that's straight from the uh, straight from the source. Your friend Ashley lives in Italy, right? Yep, she moved to Italy a few years ago. Yeah, and so she gives us all the the best intel, juicy tidbits about living in the like beautiful Italian countryside, or or actually she lives on the coast. But yeah, she's uh, what is she in Bari, Italy, or somewhere close by? Monopoly. I Monopoly, think? maybe. Monopoly. Monopoly. Like the game, but like the game, Italian, but Italian. city instead. Oh. But yeah, one of my favorite things and one of the things that made me happiest in my entire life, like, you know, maybe like top five moments, like you know, they're up there with getting married to Meg and then getting a dog of our own, Super Smash Brothers Ultimate releasing, and then subsequently Banjo-Kazooie being added to Super Smash Brothers. Up there was also that our friend Ashley told us, yes, people in Italy, especially old men, when they see something that like excites them or bothers them, they will legit just go... Oh, so that's that's a real thing. That's not a stereotype. We, they actually do that. It's actually it's funny we're talking about penne alla vodka because as we're going to talk about later on in the episode, um, it's it's a very popular like wedding and event food for New Yorkers, and we actually just passed by the day that one of our family members was going to get, I think it was his confirmation party yeah, or something. Yeah, it was supposed to be a confirmation party. And obviously, because of the pandemic, they had to cancel that. Although, ironically, now I believe New York can have gatherings of up to 50 people, so they actually could have had it, so that's a shame. But if Could it... we have, though? Your family's ginormous. Yeah, who knows? Maybe not. They could have trimmed it down. Or maybe they couldn't have. We do have a really big family. But either way, like I said, it's uh, in, in another timeline, we would have just had some penne al vodka this past Sunday. Instead, uh, we had yummy pernil. We did have yummy pernil. That was a good pork roast, and we smoked it too. So the good thing about smoked meats and smoking anything is, except cigarettes, because cigarettes are fucking disgusting. Don't smoke. And if you listen to our podcast and you smoke, then don't smoke. But smoked meats, that's A-OK. So my favorite thing about smoking stuff, though, in the, the smoker is basically, uh, like, if you're anywhere in the yard, like a, a half mile radius of a smoker, you'll, you'll smell it, and it's really tasty smelling. Actually, we didn't go over this week's Friday food. I'm going to be making patatas bravas, right? Yeah. I think you suggested that. Patatas bravas are a Spanish dish, which... I believe they're like, uh, I think they fall into tapas, maybe? I could be wrong on that. So. Don't Correct give too much away, though. We might cover them someday. We might someday, but they're just—they're basically a quick overview of Patatas Bravas. They're just kind of like 
uh, like sauteed, like they're sauteed potatoes with like delicious, like tomatoey, like spicy sauce. And you can add chicken into it. We had like a, a weird like box, like stovetop recipe that we got from Aldi. Like it's kind of like you have like box, like stuffing. It was like box panadas bravas. And it was really good, even though it was made of like just weird like potato flakes and shit. So I know it wasn't authentic, but it tasted really good and it inspired us to one day make the real thing. Yeah, they were really yummy. I'm excited to make like homemade version. Yeah. Well, I guess that wraps it up for this week's appetizers. So without further ado, oh, I present to you today's main course. Penne a la vodka is one of the most New York dishes that exists in modern day. If you've been to a wedding in the state, you've had penne a la vodka. Or even if you've been to an Italian restaurant here, you've probably had penne a la vodka. Hell, if you've eaten dinner here a single time in your entire life, odds are you probably had penne a la vodka. It's maybe the most endemic cuisine to Italian Americans, especially here on Long Island, in the New York and the New Jersey area. Oh! But for everyone outside the Tri-State area, You'll have to forgive us with this. Penne al vodka is to New York what chili is to Texas. Basically, everyone here loves it. Most people's family has some sort of recipe for it, and it serves at almost every restaurant in the area. And if you've never had it or never heard of it and you're wondering what it is, well, that's just incomprehensible to us. I don't think we can grasp that concept, but we'll do our best. Never had penne al vodka, but... But how? I it's just it's just shh, 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 shh. we'll we'll get through this together. It's it's for the it's for the people. Anyway, penne a la vodka is a pasta dish with a creamy tomato sauce that incorporates well vodka, vodka the drink, vodka the alcohol. Vodka goes into the sauce. Penne itself is a pretty common pasta shape. It comes from the Italian word for pen, which reflects the pasta being little tubes with a pointed end, like old-timey fountain pens. Yeah, I actually, I didn't realize that until we did research here, but yeah, pen, penne, it's cute. (laughs) The sauce, meanwhile, is made from tomato puree or tomato paste mixed with pancetta, aka Italian bacon, oh, and contains vodka that you burn off either by lighting it on fucking fire or you could just slowly simmer it for like 20 minutes to cook all the alcohol, you know, if you're a pussy. It gets cut with cream, which makes it get this velvety smooth texture, and it also gives it a trademark orange color. The flavor is rich, but it's not heavy, like goopy, shitty white sauces like Alfredo, and it, it almost has like a, a smoky flavor to it because of the addition of pancetta or bacon. The vodka specifically brightens up the dish, and and as well as pepper flakes that get it in to give it like a little bit of a spiciness. It prevents it from becoming overly creamy. It's a good compromise between like sharp acidic sauces like bolognese, but you know, versus thick gloopy pasta dishes like carbonara, and it is oh so good. If I recall correctly from an old Good Eats episode, I think there's some, like, chemistry shit involved with why, like, alcohol added to tomato, like, helps make tomatoes taste even more tomato-y. So, like, there's science to back up penne, uh, yeah, penne la vodka being so good. If science says it's real, then it's real. Unless it's climate change and then people just say it's not real because they don't feel like driving electric cars. But let's forget about that for now. Enough overview. I'm sure our fellow New Yorkers are well acquainted with today's topic. I'm sure they're thinking, yeah, 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 I know all about penne a la vodka. What a waste of an episode. You don't need to go over this classic Italian dish for me. It's been around forever. And if that's what you're thinking, then I got news for you, buddy. You couldn't be more wrong. It's not Italian. Oh, it's not always been popular. Oh, and it's actually a pretty recent invention, only a few decades old. Oh, now listen up, you cavones. We got a lot to cover, so let's get started and dig into the origins of this dish. So the origins of penne a la vodka are weirdly hard to pinpoint because there's not a lot of concrete documentation on them. One thing's for certain, vodka sauce is actually, like I said, a really recent creation invented only like 40 or 50 years ago tops. Growing up, like, I always pictured as some sort of, like, masterfully crafted traditional Italian sauce that's been honed by the surly housewives in the sprawling villa countrysides of Tuscany through centuries and centuries of artisanal culinary development. Nope. 
Apparently, it's just about as old as the internet. And it was probably just invented by some slick guido. It was like a, a, a slapdash last-minute effort that caught on. It really isn't, like, that much older than us. Like, only, you know, like, 10, 15 years or so. Like, we were born at just the right time to grow up with both the internet and Penny Alla Vodka. A great time to be alive. Minus the whole pandemic thing right now, but ignoring that. Despite its relative youth compared to other beloved Italian dishes, though, there's oddly not a lot of hard factual evidence surrounding its invention, like I mentioned before. There's a lot of loose anecdotes and unsubstantiated claims accredited to different people, so it's it's kind of a toss-up for where and how it was created. It's really frustrating and it's bizarre because like you got records explaining the origins of foods like steak tartare from like a thousand years ago in times when pen and paper was a distant future technology. But this pasta dish from just a few decades ago it's is a mystery. It, I guess it falls into like a weird gray zone where it wasn't quite a big deal when it was first created and so there's not a ton of serious historical study of the 1970s in the same level as say like the colonial era. So I guess it just fell through the cracks and we're stuck with all this anecdotal evidence. Maybe there's some sort of like time span we need to reach before people start going deep on it. Like the way people are still unearthing information and accounts from the American Revolution. Maybe we need to wait 200 or so years so people can excavate facts and documents from the distant past of the 1970s. Ah, I could see it now. Now if you'll turn to your next page on your holograms, you'll see figure C. These primitive cultures developed a thick, coarse floor furnishing known as a shag carpet. These shag carpets grew filthy immediately and retained tremendous amounts of pet dander and dust, sending those who dared enter into an anaphylactic shock. It was most likely used as a defense mechanism to ward off intruders, such as cocaine addicts and cops with long sideburns. I mean, mid-century, you know, like around... 1950s is being studied a lot now so it's probably not that long until we we'll get to the 70s hopefully either way i guess we could take a look at some of the inspirations behind similar sauces and cooking methods that predate vodka sauce and maybe that'll give us an idea of how it came to be so generally speaking cream sauces aren't really that popular in italy compared to americans who love a nice thick heavy sauce that makes you feel like shit 20 minutes after you eat it other types are based with tomato or wines. Those are more common, especially in the central and southern regions. Ironically, despite tomatoes being such a huge foundation for Italian cuisine, tomatoes actually weren't introduced to Italy until the 1600s. And when they were first introduced, people thought they were poisonous and were afraid to eat them. Subsequently, tomato sauces only really f saw their first usage in Italy in the 1690s, with the first recorded recipes being the cookbook Lo Scalco alla Moderna, these early sauces were probably a bit closer to modern salsas, like, rather than your standard thick marinara sauce. But they planted the roots for many, many different types of tomato sauce to come. So tomato sauce, as we discussed, has been around for a few centuries, but let's look at the other side of the equation with creamy sauces. Cream-based sauces aren't big, but they are out there. Particularly, northern Italy features a lot of dishes that put dairy at the forefront of it. Probably the most well-known dairy pasta dish is fettuccine alfredo. It's the one you see in all those Olive Garden commercials with the long, thick fettuccine noodles covered in a thick, creamy white sauce. I actually just recently learned from a BuzzFeed article, embarrassingly, that um, Americans have been making alfredo sauce wrong and real fettuccine alfredo sauce doesn't have cream in it. It's just... Yeah, like, there's no cream, but Americans love fat, so we just add a shit ton of cream, and even cream cheese I know some recipes call for, so, yeah. To be fair, cream is really good. Just not in pasta sauces. Except vodka sauce. Anyway, yeah, real Alfredo sauce in Italy, it's apparently more just, like, butter and, like, Parmigiana cheese, and that sounds a little more appetizing, honestly, than just, like, a pot full of Elmer's glue, if I'm being honest, because I don't really like Alfredo sauce. Uh, Alfredo sauce was named for its creator, Alfredo de, de Lelio. Lelio? I should have read this before. It's probably in, Alfredo de Lelio. Oh! In 1892, at his restaurant in Rome, it became an instant success in Italy and caught on in the U.S. and other countries fairly quickly. So, we've now also established Alfredo sauce was kind of a foundation for vodka sauce, and it's been around for at least a century or so since, like we said, it was uh, created... Uh, about a hundred years ago. 
But as mentioned, we didn't really see the advent of vodka sauce until the 1970s. So it took at least half a century for someone to come up with that. But there is a good reason for that. So it's time to get nitty and time to get gritty because now we're going to take a look at Penal Vodka's history and development. So as mentioned, vodka sauce combines both tomato sauces and dairy sauces. This is important to note because generally Italians wouldn't really mix the two of them. Even though it seems like there's a million different combinations of sauces in Italian cuisine, there's not a lot of variety or experimentation with like traditional Italian recipes. Yeah, so like weirdly, both of us could have sworn that there was some sort of pasta dish with creamy tomato sauce called pasta pomodoro or something similar, but like we couldn't find anything when we tried actually researching it. Like we might just be going crazy because it doesn't seem to exist. Pomodoro is just an Italian word for tomato. So anything we look up just find standard tomato sauce recipes like for marinara or arrabbiata. Yeah, if, if that ain't a great example of the Mandela effect, I don't know what the frig is. Either way, the more you think about it, though, the more it makes sense that penne al vodka just didn't exist until a couple decades ago. Like, the concept of a creamy tomato sauce, it just it didn't exist in any real mainstream form in Italy. As mentioned before, penne al vodka's exact origins aren't really well documented either, so the best we can do is just sort of agree it was created in, like, the 70s or the early 80s. Probably the early 80s, but maybe the 70s? I, I really don't know what the frick to believe anymore. So, much like our hamburger episode had a bunch of chuckle fucks claiming to have invented the burger, it's time to play another round of No, I Invented It! Oh boy, it's my favorite game. Ah, oh, but seriously, this seems like a recurring theme with this show. <laughs> and we're only three episodes in. Anyway, we've seen quite a few sources saying that, quote-unquote, many culinary historians cite American chef James... Doty, a graduate of Columbia University, is the inventor of it in the late 1970s, but we don't actually see any original sources for that. Like, beyond that, like, I couldn't even find any empirical proof that a, cha- a chef James Doty even existed, so that claim kind of sounds like bullshit. The first documented use of vodka in a pasta dish was 1974. Italian actor Ugo Toganazzi, oh, published a cookbook, La Abafone, oh, which included a recipe called Pasta all'infuriata, oh, though this wasn't exactly the vodka sauce we know today. Instead, it was similar to Pasta Arrabbiata or Pasta Putinesca since it used fresh peeled tomatoes and it didn't call for any cream yet. Another one is, this is one of the more common accounts that we've found. There's some chick that teaches law at Harvard, Paula Franzese. She claims penne al vodka was created by her father, Luigi Franzese, a chef at restaurant Orsini in New York in the early 1970s. Apparently, when he was making a pasta dish, he just supposedly threw a glass of vodka into the sauce instead of water, and voila, penne al vodka was born. As much as I want to believe this one, because it would be, like, clear-cut evidence that it was born in New York City, it just doesn't really make sense. Like, it says he was preparing the dish tableside for a customer, and, and the vodka caused the dish to ignite. How the hell did it ignite? You need to give it a flame, even with vodka, which is, you know, basically gasoline. It, it still needs an open flame to combust. But okay, okay, maybe he happened to be preparing it on, like, a, a portable gas fire grill for some reason... But if that's the case, then why ignite it? If you're preparing a dish table side, I don't know, seems kind of irresponsible to create a small explosion just like three feet away from a customer's face. And beyond that, why add vodka in the first place? Vodka tastes like poison. Uh, all right, all right, maybe it was an accident. Maybe he saw the glass of vodka, he mistook it for water, but then if he mistook the vodka for water, why did he hold a flame to it and ignite it? Okay, okay, let, let, let's let let's give him the benefit of the doubt, so, and we'll guess that the the fire was a mistake too, and he just rolled with it. But, but at this point, we're just getting ridiculous. So this guy just so happened to randomly have a portable gas grill going at a customer's table, and then he somehow managed to accidentally grab a glass of vodka instead of water, dump it in there, and then accidentally set it on fire, and everything turned out okay? Not, oh shit, like, sorry, your dish is on fucking fire, let me get you a new one, or, or even just like a, oops... Sorry, I think I just singed off your eyebrows. Please don't sue us. Get the fuck out of here. This is stupid. 
Also, this all just like hinges on the fact that he was preparing a creamy tomato sauce at the same time, which we already established was really rare until Penny All Vodka happened. Uh, everything about this story is just too fucking convenient. It just sounds like it was made up some Italian Guido dad going on to his daughter. I, I mean, I can't blame this chick for believing it, but like, I, I don't buy it. Sorry. Another possible origin story we found was from a fairly prominent celebrity chef, Marianne Esposito. She claims that her own personal research found that the dish was introduced to Italian chefs in the early 1970s by vodka distributors, who basically wanted to trick Italians into buying more vodka. It's not really clear if the dish was brought there from somewhere else, like America or Russia, or if the Italians themselves fell for it and made vodka sauce themselves. But either way, this one seems a little bit more believable than the last one, especially because, like, I don't know, salesmen like to sell their product, so it makes sense they would just be like, "Yeah, here, take vodka, yeah. make, make yummy food with it, <laughs> give us money. <laughs> Yeah, also especially because like Marianne Esposito, like she's like a she's like a cool like like low key celebrity chef. She's on like PBS and stuff, and she's cool. We've seen her show before, so she seems like she knows her shit. Also, like apparently William Sonoma had like a, a de- like a, a similar story to this as well. Said like a Roman chef created it for his restaurant Dante in the late seventies to help support vodka companies that were popping up in Italy. So. All right, all right, Italy. This seems to check out in your favor so far. I guess we can't have all the foods. Probably one of the most, like, uh, one of the more believable accounts that we have as well is a book by food writer Barbara Kafka in 1984 in which she stated that restaurants in New York began creating the modern versions of penne al vodka that were accustomed with in the mid to late 1980s. However, she said that simpler versions of it existed in Italy a few years prior to that. So, as much as we hate to admit it, this does line up with all the earlier claims about Italian chefs experimenting with vodka and cream sauces in the 70s, so it seems like the earliest forms of it were, in fact, made in Italy, and then they sort of hopped their way over to New York, where they turned into the more modern-day version. And then, apparently, over the course of the 1980s, people started trying out new things like sour cream and caviar, hot, hot pepper paste, and other fucking weird additions... Some of which stuck, like the pepper, and fortunately some of which were also left behind, like the caviar. Which is great news, because for starters, caviar is fucking disgusting. But more importantly, I don't want to live in a world where a penny al vodka costs like $70 per plate. Yeah, that's definitely a world I don't want to live in. Bizarrely enough, the dish was a fad in Italy and only stuck around there for a few years. That lady, Marianne Esposito, who we mentioned before, she said that in her own personal research, she asked dozens of people in Italy about Pagliava Vodka, and apparently none of them were familiar with the dish. Yeah, I saw a lot of other anecdotal evidence that kind of repeated this idea that Italians just don't really know about it. They didn't do much with it after a couple of years. It was just kind of like, I don't know, before memes were a thing, it was just kind of like a meme in the 1970s in, in Italy. And, like, now, like, the dish is almost unknown there. Instead, though, it took off in the States, and especially in the Northeast, and especially in good old New York, most probably due to its impressive, good Italian-American population. Oh, that takes us right up to mostly present day, so it's time to get modern. So if you're not from the area, by this point in the episode, you've probably put together that penne al vodka is New York as fuck. Not only was the dish popular in New York at the beginning of its life cycle, but it continues to be popular here today. After all, the earliest accounts of vodka sauce in America mentioned it being prepared in restaurants in New York City. As mentioned, both of us come from Italian families, and we've got the ancestry DNA results to back it up. We're both born and raised in New York. I think that means we're more than qualified in the subject of penne al vodka and what it means to all red-blooded New Yorkers. For starters, let's just throw this out there. No New York wedding is complete without penne al vodka. This isn't an exaggeration. I don't, I'm not even really joking. I don't think we've been to a single wedding over the span of either of our entire lives that didn't have penne al vodka served at it. Like, at this point, I, I think it might be against the law to not have it at your wedding. I, I don't know. I gotta check into that. I think there's two rules to living on Long Island. The first is you have to like Billy Joel, and the second is you have to have penne alla vodka at your wedding. Yeah, we weren't even, like, aware of how regional of a dish penne alla vodka is until, like, a year or two ago when we were doing our own wedding planning, 
and we were seeing posts on Wedding Wire from people in like the South or like the Midwest talking about penne a la vodka, like with some sort of like weird, strange, exotic food they'd never heard of. Like, now, now, hang on there. That's uh, that's uh, that's penne a la, a la vodka. Yeah, we want to do something unique and different, like something y'all never see at weddings. Maybe some sort of Italian food. No one's ever heard that at a, at a wedding before, but but I, but I never heard of this one penny olive. I probably shouldn't get too much of it though. You know, people gotta drive home and not after all. Yeah. Up here though, penny olive vodka. It's it's a fucking giving. It not just weddings, but like we said at the beginning of the show, any formal occasion that has catering at it, you've got like roughly an eighty five percent chance of there being penny olive vodka served there. Like. For our wedding in particular, my parents were helping out to pay for the food, which, very gracious, thanks mom and dad. Thanks guys. Yeah, that was great. But my mother, she had a fucking field day talking to businesses with, with like the caterers and stuff. Shout out to Brickhouse Brewery of Patchogue also, by the way, because they, they were the caterers for our wedding. Specifically though, uh, I'm pretty sure my mother spent like a good 15 minutes going over how they prepped their penny all vodka in like vivid vivid detail like she she wanted it al dentissimo but like cooked enough to be edible but still really firm her explanation is she wanted them to cook the pasta keep it in trays prepare the sauce separately and then like combine them together at the venue and then like the hot sauce would like cook the pasta a little bit more but the pasta wouldn't get too mushy I don't know. I, I'm also. I think she requested they like they brought an additional half gallon container of vodka sauce just to like give people extra if they needed. I don't even remember. Like, look, my mother is. She's 75 years old. She taught me a shit ton about cooking as a kid. And she's like a second generation Italian American, I think. So, but she also smokes a lot of weed. She she's a she smokes a lot of weed. But she had a moment of clarity here, and she seemed to know what she was talking about. So I wasn't gonna argue with her. You know, since when it comes to Italian food, she's a friggin' magician. It should be noted, like, while we keep referring it to, to it as penne a la vodka, a lot of restaurants and caterers around here don't always make it with penne specifically. A lot of times you'll see rigatoni a la vodka. Oh! Ziti a la vodka. Oh! Or even tortellini a la vodka. Oh! Generally, when this happens, they'll just list it as pasta a la vodka or, like, pasta with vodka sauce as a catch-all, like, term for any pasta in vodka sauce. Yeah, I know there's like a there's there's all these arguments about like the the purity and interchangeability of pasta shapes and like which sauces they pair with, but like who the frig cares? Like at least in New York, it seems like most of the time it just features some sort of tube shaped pasta, whatever the hell you want to call it. As mentioned earlier, the vodka is cooked off during the preparation of the sauce. This can be achieved one of two ways. You can flambe it by lighting the pan on fire, which looks cool as fuck, and it's a good way to act like a total badass at your next dinner party. Obviously, by doing this, you cook away the actual alcohol in the vodka, which is helpful because it prevents you from having to explain that your DUI was the result of having too much pasta that night, and also, it eliminates that disgusting paint thinner vibe that vodka just sort of tends to have. Additionally, flambéing the pan also helps caramelize certain sugars present in the onions and other drippings in the pan, and helps bring out other flavors in the sauce later on. Also, it helps cut down on cooking time because the alternative to this is to just sort of combine everything together into a pan and slowly simmer it for like 20-25 minutes, which is like it eliminates the alcohol by causing it to evaporate away. The flambé method, many people have singed their eyebrows doing this because, man, you only need a little bit of vodka and holy shit, does it create a big flame. Yeah, I've, uh, somehow I'm always the one who ends up lighting it on fire and I'm the one who's most afraid of fire. I don't know why that's the thing that keeps happening, but those flames are scary. Yeah, ironically though, yeah, like, when, when you're cooking it at home, like, most of the time, like, the dad of the household loves doing this part because you know, men, fire, fire, yeah, like, men love fire, fireworks, anything to do with fire. It's actually pretty common for, like, most Italian families to, like, have a vodka sauce recipe that they, that it seems like it's been passed down for, like, a hundred years, but given what we know now about the dish's history, it's, it's probably been passed down for, you know, a decade. It's definitely, like, it's definitely an Italian-American comfort food kind of jam, though, so, so everybody's got their own version of it. Actually, on that note, while we're talking recipes, Let's have a look at this week's recipe, which comes courtesy of Meg's father. So the ingredients for penne al vodka, a la Adamo, is one pound of penne pasta, 
a half a pound of prosciutto or bacon, four tablespoons of butter, two tablespoons of finely minced shallots or onions, a teaspoon of pepper flakes, half a cup of vodka, one and a half cups of cream, two and a third cups of tomato puree, a tablespoon of Italian seasoning, and an eighth of a teaspoon of salt. For starters, you chop your prosciutto or your bacon up into little tiny pieces, and then you toss that butter into the large saucepan, and you begin sauteing the shallots and the onions until it's delicious and your entire kitchen smells awesome, or like two to three minutes. So after the onion is browned, add the prosciutto and lower the heat to low and cook for another five to ten minutes, or until the prosciutto is cooked. Add in the vodka and get ready, because after this, it's showtime. There's a few ways that you can start your flambe. The easiest and the safest way that we uh, that we recommend is use like a long match. Light the match and then carefully bring it to the pan and just light it on fire. As mentioned, vodka is just like jet fuel, so stand back because it's going to be a pretty big flame. That said, as big as it is, it's not going to jump out and like burn your house down unless you do something stupid. Another way you could do it is if you use one of those like handheld fire stick things, but if you use that, you got to pull it away really fast as soon as the vodka lights because actually I don't know if it could like shoot into the tube and like explode the thing in your hand. I don't think so, but like, you know. Don't take that chance. Yeah, why take that chance? Third method and possibly the coolest fucking way of all can only be done if you have a gas stove. Basically, you just tilt the pan diagonally and eventually the vapors of the vodka in the pan just ignite on their own without even touching the flames. <sighs> it's another reason why I hate having our shitty electric coil stove. I'd just like to mention at this point, if you're using bacon instead of prosciutto, which we do a lot because prosciutto is expensive and bacon is cheaper, we've been taking to cooking the bacon separately, not in the pan. Yeah, because. Bacon fat is also jet fuel, so that, like, you really do, it, it's a bit of a fire hazard if you're doing lighting alcohol and bacon fat <laughs> on fire. So if you're doing prosciutto, you can cook it in the pan with the onions. If you're doing bacon, like, cook it separate and then put it in later after the alcohol has been lighted on fire. Yeah, take the bacon out <laughs> because if not, then you basically just started a grease fire and uh, rest in peace. Yeah. Anyway, once the pan's on fire, now what? Well, nothing. Alcohol is a volatile compound that burns easily. The flame should die down and eventually go out after a minute or so. While it's burning, just keep an eye on it and make sure there's nothing flammable near it, like a wooden spoon or a towel or anything like that. Yeah, it's also worth noting, in an emergency, if for some reason it seems like the fire is going to, I don't know, attack you or like pull a gun on you or something, if you're really nervous about the fire, you can easily put the fire out just by putting a lid on top of it. It'll just like burn out the oxygen and the fire will go out. But like I said, unless you have like the grease fire thing with the bacon going on, the fire will go out on its own. It's not, you don't need to be too scared of it, but you can put it out in an emergency. Either way, once the flame is out, you can then add in the tomato puree, the cream, and then you stir those in and combine them until the sauce turns like a pink-orange color. You add in your spices, you stir them in, let the sauce simmer for like another 15 minutes, and after that, you're good to go. You slap that sauce onto some nice penne and cover that shit in some Pecorino Romano. Or if you don't have any of that, Parmesan cheese works too. I, I guess. So... Yeah, that's that's our recipe that we use. Uh, as far as other modern day things with penne al vodka, yeah, this this next modern day representation we've seen that's like super recent. Uh, apparently, vodka sauce got like really trendy a few weeks ago on TikTok for some reason. Like, uh, let me see here. Supposedly, it started because Gigi Hadid posted a video of her making vodka sauce. And then her, like, celebrity family members did the same thing. And then that prompted, like, other fake celebrities to upload videos of themselves making vodka sauce. And then it just turned to this big thing where everybody on the fucking internet followed suit. And Penny Al Vodka just got, like, really big for, for about a minute. So, uh, I got a couple of questions here. For starters, literally who the fuck is Gigi Hadid? I I'm not being funny here. Like, I, I honest to God didn't know who she was. I had to look her up to find out, like, why this was a big deal, why people cared. Apparently, she's an American fashion model who's been active since she was two? Like, two years old? Uh, all right. Uh, okay. I thought maybe she was, you know, in, involved in food or culinary arts somehow. Like, 
maybe a, a celebrity chef or, I don't know, a celebrity who's, like, involved with cooking. You know, not just some fucking rich pretty girl who's famous for being rich, rich and pretty. I knew that she was a model from posts on Tom and Lorenzo, but that was it. Like, I thought maybe she was related to the architect Zaha Hadid, who I know a little bit more about from work, but, um... Yeah, they're not related. To be fair, I don't know who Zaha Hadid is either, but, like, hell, like, if, if she was an architect, that's really cool. Like, a female architect that's famous, like, you know, she builds and creates things that are impressive and, and great. And, you know, instead of, like I said, just being famous for being pretty. Yeah, but with this chick, though, Gigi Hadid, like, I, I figured, like, all right, well, you know, maybe maybe she's, like, Italian-American or, like, half italian American, so, like, maybe that's why people care yeah, okay, she looks like she could be, like, maybe half it to, uh, oh, oh, she, she's Dutch and Palestinian. Yep, nothing quite says Italian-American like Palestine and the Netherlands. Man, you know how, like, everyone was bitching about cultural appropriation in restaurants a few years ago? Can we, like, can we, like, cancel Gigi Hadid for appropriating our people's food? No, no, uh, all right. All right, fine. Seriously, though, I'm not joking. I have no fucking clue who she was until I looked all this up. Like, I'm not acting. The closest thing to an interesting story I could find about Gigi Hadid was, uh, apparently a few years ago, she, like, posed in, like, some video for Love magazine, but she had, like, some lint residue from, like, her jacket stuck under her arms, and it made, like, you know, it made it look like she hadn't shaved for the, for the photo shoot. So as the internet tends to do, obviously there is there is outrage attacking her, calling her disgusting for not shaving, and then outrage defending her, saying that anybody who cares about it is a fucking monster, and then you know it caused this whole online shitstorm and argument. And but then she had her PR reps inform everyone, no, 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 it's just jacket fuzz. Calm down, everyone. You know, honestly, she should have just went with it. Like a little pit hair would have given her some Italian cred. Why do people even care that much about a model's jacket fuzz pit hair? Because people have nothing better to do. They just like to fucking criticize, and, and especially with celebrities. Celebrities are it's just like, people love to love celebrities and worship them, but they also fucking love to just tear them down and, and fucking hate them and criticize them in every fucking, I don't know. <sighs> well, you know what? Fuck everybody. And actually, for that matter, fuck TikTok as well. Like, uh, can, I, can I get a minute to, like, complain about this? I like how a few years ago we had, like, Vine, and that was stupid and pointless, and it stopped existing after a few years because nobody liked it. And then, like, four years later, some Chinese company does the exact same thing, and people are going, yes, this is what the internet really needs, more of 15-second-long karaoke videos by teenagers. Where people just really sitting around saying, like, you know what my least favorite part of YouTube is? The unlimited free upload space. I really wish there was arbitrary upload restrictions that made it so I can only upload really short videos with absolutely no substance. Ugh. Dumb. Dumb. Vine was dumb, and Chinese Vine is still dumb. Fucking, fucking whatever. I, I don't care if it makes sounds like an old person shaking my fist and shaking my cane. Whatever. I don't give a shit if I sound old. I have red hair, and I sleep next to a mountain of stuffed animals every night. Eat my ass. Your minute is up. Speaking of nobodies talking about their penny all vodka recipes, weirdly enough, while researching this week's episode, I came to realize that a lot of recipes featured online were written by absolute weak sauce babies who were totally afraid of fire. Seriously though, there is approximately 600 million vodka sauce recipes out there, and I think I might have found like five of them tops that actually called for igniting the vodka. Like, in fact, most recipes I show, uh, that I saw said to be careful to keep the sauce away from flames to make sure you don't ignite it. What the fuck is that shit? It's just a little fire. It's never hurt anybody. Well, you know, except for all the, the thousands upon thousands of people who have been killed in house fires, but that's besides the point. Flambeing is a totally viable cooking technique. It's, it's Like I said before, it's pretty safe as long as you don't do anything stupid. Like, the fire will go out on its own. I mean, I, I guess it's like a, a liability thing. Websites don't want people burning their houses down and being held responsible for it. On that note, please note, Poor Couples Food Guide cannot make any guarantees of safety and is not responsible for any fires, flames, accidents, or injuries, either personal or real, suffered while cooking penny all vodka, and can and will not be held liable for any issues that may arise. By listening to this message, you waive your right to sue us, especially under the premise that we are verbatim titled The Poor Couple, and thus have no viable assets, which can be forfeited in civil suits. Thank you.
Seriously, though, if you're making palatka sauce at home, that's just like, it's part of the experience. It looks cool and it feels impressive to know you made this pasta dish by using this cool skill that you see celebrity chefs doing on TV. But like, really, if you're not concerned with that experience, like, I don't know, just go buy some shitty jar sauce from Lombardi's Market and you freaking cavone. We won't judge. Well, we'll judge you a little bit, but we'll do it silently behind your back. But hey, at least your food will be tasty as fuck, because no matter what you decide, penne a la vodka is a freaking delicacy. Oh! So, that just about covers it for today's main course. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. You forgot about another modern day application of penne a la vodka. The ultimate combination of comfort foods for Italian-American New Yorkers. The penne a la vodka pizza. Full of enough carbs to run three marathons, this marriage of pasta and dough may seem like too much, but really, it's perfect. Since instead of needing bread to sop up the extra sauce, the bread just gets right there underneath, and you get everything in one bite. Can we go get pizza when we're done with this? Ooh, ooh yeah, let's let's do that right now. Let's, let's just go get some pizza now. Alright, show's over, folks. Have fun. Bye. JK, JK, we're still here. Yeah, there, there is in fact a, uh, a they, we have penny olive vodka pizza here in, on Long Island in New York. Uh, I think that's more of, yeah, that's that's definitely got to be more of a really modern invention in, in and of itself. Like it's, uh, if penny olive vodka ha- has only been around for a few decades, I'd be surprised if penny olive vodka pizza has been around more than, you know, two decades. But yeah, it's it's heavy, but it is oh so good. It's like eating a good old Italian American lullaby. We should see if Aunt Mia's pizzeria has some this Saturday. Yeah, good idea. Anyway, that just about covers it for today's main course. I hope you guys saved some room for dessert. I just want to take a minute here, like this isn't sponsored at all, but I just want to give a quick shout out to Chewy for being just a real like top tier company so like for charlie's birthday party we bought one of their birthday boxes and it was adorable yeah it's basically just a giant like surprise box or like a mystery like blind bag box for a doggy birthday it and was then, really cute yeah and then like before that one of his other birthday presents i bought a toy and i was dumb and didn't read the sizes properly and it was too big so I asked to exchange it, and they were like, we don't really do exchanges, but we'll refund your money and send you the new one. Just donate the old toy, the incorrect toy, to an animal shelter by you, which I'm going to do this week. I'm going to drop it off at a shelter by my work. And um, so, yeah, that was really nice yeah, of them. Yeah, it was them. really stand-up of them. Yeah, really and cool. then, like, just to top it all off, today in the mail, there was just a handwritten card from Chewy, like a birthday card for yeah. Charlie from Chewy, and it was freaking adorable. Yeah, someone at... Someone that works for Chewy, like, took a birthday card and wrote, like, happy birthday, Charlie, hope you have a great day, like, as if it was one of their freaking family members. It was really, really sweet. Yeah, so, like, if any of you out there have pets and have been considering trying Chewy, like, I would absolutely recommend it. Yeah. Not even trying to get sponsorship, although, like, obviously, that'd be cool. Yes, but, please, like, please not Please sponsor trying. us, Chewy. We will, we will throw a shout out to you in every single mm-hmm. episode from here on out. But, yeah, just, like, yeah want to recognize that they're like really cool yeah they're great okay yeah it it is it is definitely getting very hot in here and uh we gotta wrap this up before we just like melt into fucking puddles are you ready for this week's shitty old recipes are you ready for this week's shitty old recipes? No, I'll never be ready for any of these fucking <laughs> vertruvian monsters, horror, bro. All right. So, shitty old recipes is a game we like to play where we delve into the worst recipes that we can find in old timey cookbooks that we have on our shelves. One of us reads the title, and the other tries to guess what unthinkable ingredients make it up. Today, I'll be guessing, and Meg is going to be reading. So, let's get started. All right, so this week we're pulling again from the treasure trove of, of ye old cookery, which we mentioned last week. Yeah, last week. If you didn't listen to last week's episode, at least go listen to the ending where we just, uh, what did we do? We mashed potato candy? Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, um, if you want to know how someone fucking managed to put together mashed potato candy, then give a, give last week's episode, a, give that a spin, the hamburger episode, because uh, that's a doozy. <laughs> 
So, all right, uh, show me what you got. All right, so earlier when we were eating dinner, I asked you to help narrow down these options because there's a lot of options in here to choose from for this game. If you wanted a recipe where it seems like they don't know what cookies are or if they don't know what sugar is, and you chose to go with the one where it doesn't seem like they know what cookies are. Yeah, I picked the cookie one because I like cookies, which in retrospect... Probably a bad idea, because it's probably going to make me cry. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't know if you're going to like cookies anymore. Shit. All right, so the name of this recipe is Sugarless Cookies. Oh, no. Go. No, why would they do that to cookies? Sugar is like the most important part of every cookie. Oh, fuck. Okay, well, uh, flour. It's got to have flour, right? Yes, it has four cups of flour. Okay, thank God. I... I was afraid this was going to be like some weird like paleo vegan thing that's like first ingredient, a cup of fucking dirt. Uh, okay, well, normally I would say second ingredient should be sugar, but these are sugarless cookies, so, um, butter? Um, close. Oh, okay, uh, how about some good old fucking fashioned margarine, also known as like yellow chemicals that we fucking pretend it are healthier than butter but actually worse for you than butter is it margarine yeah there's a pound of margarine Ugh. all right so we got some flour we got some margarine all right um how about uh all right well these don't have sugar in them how about does it have a does it have any sort of sweet thing in it to replace the sugar um no oh <laughs> Oh, really? Oh, my. Ooh. Are these really cookies? Like I said, I feel like it really stretches the definition of a cookie. May All right. Maybe someone. Oh, okay. All right. So we've got, we got flour and we got margarine. Okay. Where can we go from here? Um, I will say this. The dog biscuits I made for Charlie's birthday party had more ingredients than these cookies. You only have two more ingredients left. There's to only guess. two more ingredients. <laughs> yeah, is one of them salt? No. Oh my. F okay. Uh, uh, chocolate. Nope. Vanilla. Yes. There's uh, one and a half teaspoons of vanilla. Uh, there's there's vanilla in here. Yes. All right. Uh, peanut butter. Nope. You're going to be very sad. Oh, oh, okay. I was about to ask if it was going to be like a legit ingredient or if it's going to be like a, a, a practical gag humor ingredient. <laughs> it's the latter, isn't it? Yes. I mean, <sighs> I think they considered it a real ingredient oh, somehow. Oh, fuck. Uh, celery. No. Okay. How about cat food? No. <laughs> uh... Uh, okay, uh, I'm gonna need a I'm gonna need a hint of some sort here. What what is it? What is it? What's the first letter? I will. We have some in our refrigerator. Oh, okay, that makes it fun. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, soda. No. Uh, all right. Uh, uh, egg. No. Okay, it's not an egg. Um. Hmm. How about some? Some like one month old buffalo sauce. That that's in there, right? That's no longer in our refrigerator. We just threw it out. Oh. And also, it's not in this recipe. Okay. Well, uh, things in our refrigerator. Let's say carrots. No, but it does start with the C. Okay, so it's in our fridge and it starts with the C. Uh, let's say how about? Uh, oh no, I already said celery, not celery. Is it a vegetable? No. Is it a fruit? No. Okay. Oh, oh no. Is it cheese? It's a cheese. Oh no, it's a cheese. Oh god, no. These aren't cookies. Oh no. Do you want to guess what kind of cheese or do you give up? Oh my god. Mozzarella cheese? No. Oh no. Is it like Parmesan cheese? No. Oh my Cream cheese? No. Cream what? cheese would be better. What? <laughs> I give up. What what kind of cheese goes into these fucking monstrosities? A pound of cottage cheese. No! <laughs> no! 
Cottage cheese. Yes. Oh my god! It's just flour, margarine, vanilla, and cottage cheese. Yes. That's that's not a fucking cookie. That's like a, a fucking fever dream about dystopian murder. Who? The, the dog is so sad. He's going to bed. The dog is leaving. The he, dog is leaving. He legit he, he just got, got up, up and left. Oh my fucking! Fu- In what case the- anyone's curious, what you do is cut margarine into flour as for pastry, add vanilla and cottage cheese, mix well, chill overnight, roll into quarter inch, cut with cookie cutter Please of your choice. Please tell me it gets baked. Please tell me it gets bake, cooked. Bake at 400 okay. degrees for 10 minutes. It's got that going for it. Be sure to make sure the cookies don't burn because you don't want them to taste bad. Oh, yeah, no. These these sound lovely. The, 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 the cottage cheese really brings out the margarine. <laughs> oh, fuck. Did, maybe they thought that cottage cheese has sugar in it. Did cottage cheese used to have sugar in it at some point in history? I don't think so. I mean, they would sell the ones that have, like, fruit with it. Actually, I don't even know. I think that's a modern thing yeah, to sell with fruit with it. Yeah. My grandma would add fruit to it, but it didn't have the fruit with it. Fuck. Imagine making this and bringing it and giving it to somebody. Like, I, I'd i rather you fucking sneeze in my face than give me one of these. Yeah, that's, um... That's pretty bad. Uh, maybe, maybe they were like, you know, okay, maybe it was like a person who was like ESL or something, and they they translated like they were translated into like English, but then they translated like British English, and over in like England they called them like biscuits or whatever, or like, and then they mistook that for for cookie, and then it's and on then... the same page as other desserts, though. Oh, jeez! Wow, wow, that's. I don't like cookies anymore. <laughs> I don't like food anymore. I, I will never eat food again. I wish it was cream cheese and it would just be like a few ingredients short of our chocolate chip cookie recipe. But All right. nope, it was cottage cheese. Cottage cheese. There there you have it, folks. There's your, your sugarless cottage cunt cheese that's fucking disgusting and just mostly flour. It's just... Isn't that like basically the recipe that when people make like... Uh, when they bake like Christmas ornaments... Probably. Like, just, just, except with cottage cheese in it. Okay. All right, peeps. With that, we are all set here. Check, please. Oh, also. Oh! Well, that's it for this week's edition of Poor Couples Food Guide Deep Dish. Remember, we are, in fact, the only podcast left where you're more likely to learn about cereal than cereal killers. You can search recipes, cooking tips, and other cool stuff on our website, poorcouplesfoodguide.com. And don't forget, you can always write into us at poorcouplesfoodguide at gmail.com to ask for any food advice that you may need. You can also send in any comments, feedback, criticism, hate mail, love mail, chain letters, postcards, and whatever random pondering should pass your mind. And like we said, we'll probably read anything that you send to us unless it's like, you know, excessively racist. Once again, that's poorcouplesfoodguide at gmail.com. Or if you like, you can hit us up on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram as well. Shout out to Kyle on Facebook for guessing this week's topic. He's another friend of the show who built some awesome military models in his spare time. Seriously, the dude wins awards and shit for them in like regional competitions. His stuff is that good. He shows them off a lot on Twitter, so go search for him at Copperhead. K-O-P-P-E-R-H-E-D. That's Copperhead on Twitter. Yeah, so go check out some of his work. Next week, we'll be serving up a dish that's similar to our first episode's topic, soda bread, though this one's a little interesting because it's a lot younger. It's only existed about for like a hundred years, about the same time as hamburgers. It straddles the line between sweet treat dessert, but also like a legitimate breakfast bread that you can enjoy on the go without feeling like a total schlub for eating it. Think you know what it is? Write in and comment or anywhere you can, and if you guess the right answer, we'll feature you in next week's episode. Until then, everybody, stay hungry and keep feeding that brain. And tummy.